Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 90. Written by Pepper Antique. Pull. James yelled as he jumped to the side, narrowly avoiding a swing from Keeler's axe. Its blade was wrapped in thick leather to keep it from being deadly. But it still hurt like hell to get hit by. A few yards away to his right a chunk of stone and dirt rose from the ground and began to arc away from where the two of them were sparring. James rolled underneath a sideways swipe of the axe. He could feel his sword pulling his right hand towards where V. Lyrie was standing, almost casually, and casting the spells. His left arm shot out, and he felt the energy build up before a lance of fire magic shot out and scorched the flying wad of earth. Then he had to bring the sword up, resisting its pull, to block an overhead chop. His training had ramped up. He was now being trained to maneuver, cast, and sword fight simultaneously. Another aspect of the training was learning how to resist his sword's enchantment while in battle. Its mage-seeking ability was incredibly useful if he was ONLY fighting a caster. But in a brawl, or a melee, it could prove a deadly distraction if he was engaged in a fight while a caster was nearby. Additionally, the blade didn't recognize friend or foe, it only recognized offensive magic. Meaning that if their group entered a fight and Vlyri began casting spells to help him, the blade would still do everything in its power to draw him towards her. The only exception would be if another caster was targeting him directly, as it was set to pull towards the greater threat to its wielder. Resisting the blade's desire was a Herculean effort. Each time Vlyri cast he could feel the blade pulling him, both trying to make his arm swing towards her and manipulating the direction of his movements. It had been a confusing effect at first, but he was getting the hang of working with and against it. Pull! He yelled again, as he stepped inside of Keela's current attack, ruining her aim and forcing her to backpedal to keep from being stabbed by the sheathed sword. Another wad of earth rose up behind him. He only knew it was there because the blade tried to pull backwards, telling him that the attack was likely targeting him this time. He smirked a bit. Then instead of trying to blast the attack with magic, he simply ducked. Keeler had managed to jump back out of the reach of his thrust, and had brought her axe back into a backhanded attack, when he did. She had just long enough to don a look of confusion at the fact that he'd almost dropped to the ground. Then the basketball-sized clump of dirt and rocks slammed into her chest. It wasn't a hard impact, the dirt wasn't hard-packed or anything, and it was only moving about as fast as a lobbed baseball but the size and weight of the projectile meant that it was still a hell of an impact. As a result, Keeler was left stumbling backwards as James charged forward to finish off the match. He was charging in for a slash across Keeler's chest plate, when suddenly the blade began to pull again, this time to the side. One of the surprise attacks that they had agreed would have to happen to keep the training realistic. So he did the other part of the training, and instead of resisting the sword's pull, he embraced it. He let the blade pull his arm, causing his slash to redirect at a higher angle and pull his step into a position that would have put him off foot, if he hadn't done it willingly. At the same time he drew in the energy for a different kind of spell. One that he'd only learned a few days before and was still getting the hang of. A shimmer of red energy flowed over his left arm as it raised up, it took a position that he thought looked like a boxer blocking an incoming jab. It made sense that it did, since that was effectively what it was trying to do. The sword bit into the flying ball of dirt and cut it in half easily. James's left arm rose up just in time to punch the lower half of the projectile into a spray of stone and dust. Then it got on in the way of the upper half and stopped it dead in its tracks. The red shimmering energy dissipated the energy of the impact well enough that James barely felt his arm be pushed back just the tiniest bit, before the projectile was flung backwards and away by the warding shield. It fell to the ground with a dull impact as James let the blade continue down to point at the ground beside him. He smiled, happy that he'd finally gotten the warding spell figured out well enough to use in a fight. Then he felt the firm leather that was wrapped around Keeler's axe lightly rest against the back of his neck. Congratulations on finally getting warding shield figured out. Keeler said smugly from behind him. But you just lost your head. James's shoulders sagged as he turned around to look at the grinning werewolf. Had to take the moment from me didn't you? He asked, just a little annoyed. She cocked an eyebrow as she replied. There are no moments in the heat of battle. 
she said in a tone that reminded him of his old drill sergeants. You keep fighting until you've won, or else you die to somebody else who's fighting until they win. As she said the word win, she popped him on the top of his helmet with the side of her axe. James felt the sword pull his hand, and resisted it as V. Lyrie walked up to them. You did do a good job though. The small mage said as she looked at the blade cautiously. You read the sword's intentions well and used them to your advantage. And the ward was well utilized. Thanks. He said as he stood up. Keela placed the head of her axe on the ground and used the handle like a cane. I like that spell. Does the bounce back get stronger? He asked. Oh yes. V. Lyri replied. It's just like any other magic, it'll get stronger with you, and will act as strongly as you tell it to once you get to that point. She placed her finger on her chin. I've even heard of people using it to send projectiles back to their source with lethal speed. But that usually takes a lot of focus, hard to do in a full-on battle. Mostly that's only done in duels. James just shrugged. Hey, maybe some day. Keela pulled her axe up and rested it on her shoulder. Come on. She said. We've got time for one more round before Jixel is done with that stew she threw on. Let's get to it. James walked a few yards away and raised his sword up in a fighting stance. He was still amazed at how light the blade was for being so long. Vilairi took up her spot a few yards away, then readied another attack. Pull. James yelled as he rushed towards Keela. Tilda 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 tilda. Almost had her that last time. Jixel said from up beside him. Would have gotten her if your sword hadn't beaten you for her. James didn't reply to the mockery. He didn't want to relive the last match he'd had with Keela before dinner had been served. Plus he still had the bruise on his temple to remind him of its lesson. How much longer before we hit the next town on the way? He asked, changing the subject. About two days. She replied, taking the hint. Any word from Amina? James pulled his phone out and checked it real quick. Nothing today. But she said yesterday that she'd be taking off probably at the end of the week. Griffin? Yeah. Bringing a few of the Royal Guard with her too. Gonna link up with her brother before catching up to us. He said. That'll be a fun trip in this weather. She said while gesturing to the still frosty ground around them. I already told her to bundle up. He joked. Hopefully the snow holds out just a bit longer. Jixel said as she rubbed her hands against Maxel's ribs. The massive drake rumbled a little with the telltale purr that the drakes did when they warmed up for a breath attack. James felt the heat grow and placed his hands on her side too. His gloves were good and thick, but his hands were still a little chilly. Still, the warmth of the massive creature felt great in comparison. I'm glad these guys keep themselves warm. He said. On my world reptile struggle in the winter. Some of them can kinda hibernate, but for a lot of them winter is deadly. Their fire saves them. They still get sluggish, and do what they can not to be active. She said. But they survive winter just fine. Good. He said. Now, anything cool at this next town? He asked. Drinton? She asked. Not really. Bit of a hole in the wall place. Last time I was there they had a fighting tournament in one of the fields nearby. But that's only in summer, and it wasn't very impressive. What? Not enough people sign up or something? He asked. That and none of them were very strong. She said with a hint of disappointment. The prize was nice. But I felt like I was taking Smeplis from a gremlin. James furrowed his eyebrows at the term. He knew what it meant. It was just one of those weird parallels this place had with Earth. One of those, close, but not quite right, things. Candy from a baby, he corrected. What? She asked. It's a taking candy from a baby, not Smeplis from a gremlin. He reiterated. 
Why would you take candy from a baby? She asked, even more confused now. Why would you take Smeplis from a gremlin? He countered. Because the little bastards use it to enhance their venom. She said incredulously. They are not really a threat before that. But if they get some Smeply juice they can put you on your ass with one bite. She turned to face him. Why the fuck would you take candy from a baby? I wouldn't. He assured her. It's just the same. What kind of fucked up place takes candy from babies? She asked with disgust at the notion. We don't. He assured her. It's just a phrase. Well it's a fucked up phrase. She said finally. The two of them rode in awkward silence for a moment. Then James had to ask. Do you guys really have gremlins? Do you not? She asked. Not outside of a really campy set of Christmas movies. He replied. What's Christmas? It's a holiday. He said. One with a really weird history and way too many annoying songs. And how do gremlins relate to it? They don't. He said simply. They really don't. He decided to change the subject. I'm a send up a drone. Two days later when they entered Drinton, they were watched very carefully. The people watching them didn't move to follow when they left the next day. But they did what they could to keep eyes on the group the entire time they were there. They also tried to eavesdrop on them. But they never made it obvious, and they didn't follow the group. They simply made sure that they always had someone nearby when they could. Even if it was simply keeping an eye on them through a shuttered window, or from across the street. Orders to make a move on the hero hadn't come down. For now it was simply observe and report. So that was what they did. And when the party left the town, the observers gathered and wrote their report up. After the report was written, the oldest of them pulled a key from their sleeve and wished the others farewell. He put the key into the door to their room, turned it, watched it vanish as the door glowed for a brief second. Then they stepped through the door to carry their message. But the older man never came back through the door. Nor did he emerge from any door anywhere else. Ever.